Hey, good afternoon, everyone. We're, we're going to transition very quickly now into our next session. So welcome to the session now on human rights. I'm Margaret Young. I'm the head of human rights at BSR, and I'll be the moderator for the next panel. Now, this, this next panel is designed to mark a, a very special occasion. That is, next month on December 10th is the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the Universal Declaration is more than just a few hundred words written on a piece of paper. It's the cornerstone of an, our entire international human rights regime. And it's actually the closest this planet has ever come to a consensus on the ethical treatment of people. Now, since its adoption in 1948, there have been over 100 additional human rights instruments to, to further clarify and elaborate on these rights. And indeed, an, an entire international system with the, with the UN as the linchpin has grown up to further define and monitor and hold to account on these rights. And still, 70 years later, the Universal Declaration sits at the centerpiece of this entire system. Now, I'm admittedly kind of a nerd for human rights. So to celebrate this occasion, I decided to go back and read all the provisional verbatim records or the drafting records around the Universal Declaration. And there were a few things which struck me as I read that. The first was the, just a, there was a palpable sense of urgency in the drafting. The, the world was just coming out of the second horrific world war. And the drafting of the declaration was propelled forward by this sense of never again. Never again can we allow the world to reach this stage. The second thing that struck me was that it wasn't inevitable that this little venture would be successful and that we would actually be able to reach agreement on a universal set of values. The world was just starting to split or divide between East and West, and also fracture lines were starting to show among the newly decolonized territories. So no one knew whether the best or the worst of human nature was going to win out in this drafting process. You can probably imagine that you know, some of you have participated in, in, session, in sessions in your business to draft uh, statements of, of business principles or human rights policies. And, and you know it gets heated debate. And so imagine the, the discussion that you've experienced, and then multiply that times about 100, and you'll understand where the debates around the Universal Declaration had landed in 1947 and 1948. The last thing that struck me was just how different the world was at that time. Business wasn't even on the radar. So the, the drafters of the Universal Declaration were, were looking at states as being the most powerful entities. They were the ones that were most likely to violate human rights, and the ones that were most likely to support or protect human rights. But the drafters never would have imagined the world that we live in right now. So we live in a world where a single company can have greater revenue than the GDP of all of Sub-Saharan Africa combined. And we live in a, in a world where the United Nations is operating in 193 countries, and Coca-Cola is operating in more than 200 countries. And we're living in a world now where a, a, a company will collect and hold more data on us than our own governments. So all of that would have seemed like science fiction back in 1948. And so in a, in a different and changing world, with increasing power of business and the increasing prevalence of technology, we need leadership in order to keep our universal values and our international instruments relevant for today's world. And I'm delighted to introduce you to three of the most outstanding human rights leaders I know. So the first we're going to hear from is John Ruggie. He is professor of human rights and international relations at Harvard University. John has introduced and championed some of the most important ideas in the field of global governance. 
but he's also played an active role as a practitioner, shaping the development of the MDGs, leading efforts to reform the UN, and establishing the Global Compact. But most significantly, he created the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which many still affectionately call them the Ruggy Principles. I think it's fair to say that he, more than perhaps any other person, is responsible for the human rights regime maturing into the world we're living in now. So please welcome John Ruggie. I'm following Aaron's good example of dropping my mic as I come up here. He's, he's our great leader, and so, you know, we have to do the same sort of thing. If you'll excuse me for a second while I uh, put this back on. And how do I do this? I, I, the green arrow, yeah, that makes it go around? Okay. I'm a high-tech guy. <laughs> I have an iPhone 6. What have you got? <laughs> it's, so, it's so nice to be here with you, especially um, on, on this important panel um, on the uh, 70th anniversary of the, uh, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It, 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 Margaret was right. It was an extraordinary uh, development. Um, it, it was um, an aspirational statement. Um, everybody knew that what it expressed was not going to be acted upon uh, immediately. And as Margaret said, it was highly unlikely that anyone would have expected business to jump right in. Although, um, if you look at the text, this is in the preamble, it is addressed not only to states, but to every organ of society. Now, how many people here think of yourselves as an organ of society? <laughs> I hope everybody does, right? I mean, it was addressed to uh, educational institutions to religious institutions, but every organ of society, of course, also included and does business, more so today uh, than ever before. And so what I'd like to do in the few minutes uh, that I have available is to try to suggest how we at, at, uh, at the UN and with, uh, with uh, academic institutions and businesses have sort of followed up on the Universal Declaration, as it were, uh, to make it real um, for uh, not only states, but for other organs of society, if I can uh, use that phrase again. Um, the person who, more than anyone else, opened the door uh, to, to this uh, process um, was my favorite boss, um, Kofi Annan, who unfortunately uh, recently passed away. Um, at, at the World Economic Forum in the year 2000, he made a very simple statement in a very humble sort of way, addressing the world's business leaders. And he said, my friends, the simple fact of the matter is that if we cannot make globalization work for all, in the end, it will work for none. It was a prophetic statement. In fact, he used other terms such as, if we don't add social and environmental pillars to globalization, we will see protectionism, nationalism, xenophobia return. And that was a long time ago. And it, we have seen the picture that he uh, prophetically uh, foresaw um, in recent years. So building on the Anan legacy, all um, without approval of governments, the first step, and Aaron was present at the creation as well, was to establish something called the Global Compact. And I'm sure all of you know about the Global Compact. It was literally a partnership between the United Nations and global business. Um, and business was asked essentially to commit to um, 
engaging in UN values and UN goals in the areas of human rights, um, uh, la labor standards, which are part of human rights, uh, environmental principles, um, and um, anti-corruption later on. So we, we, when we launched this, we actually cheated. We said that there were 50 companies that had signed up. There were 47. Today, there are more than 9,000, after 4,000 have actually been expelled for non-performance or insufficient performance. 50 plus national networks uh, around the world. Secondly, the Millennium Development Goals. I was delighted to, 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 to listen to Vas about what the extraordinary things Novartis is doing. Well, when we launched the Millennium Development Goals, it was our purpose to engage people in business and in governments to look for opportunities to meet eight simple goals having to do with education, having to do with health, having to do with uh, maternal health issues in particular. That was sort of step number two. Step number three, the principles for responsible investing. Well, you have companies, and everybody was addressing companies. What about the companies behind the companies, um, including financial institutions um, and investors? This was a very modest step. Um, today, um, 1,800 signatories, um, $70 trillion under management. OK, so if we get um, the investors involved, we need to get stock exchanges involved. And so the initiative called the Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative was launched. And finally, um, the guiding principles for business and human rights, which Margaret um, already mentioned. They were adopted um, in 2011, the first time that the UN adopted a normative set of guidelines for business uh, in the area of human rights. I think most of you know the guiding principles rest on three pillars. Protect, respect, and remedy. Protect, it's the state duty to protect against human rights abuses, um, including by third parties, not only states, but also third parties, and third parties include businesses. Corporations, the responsibility to respect, which is to say uh, to um, uh, not interfere with the realization of human rights and make positive contributions to it. And the um, right of victims for remedy. What do we expect of companies? A policy commitment, conducting human rights due diligence, and uh, participating in remedial programs where they are linked to human rights harm. Now, we lucked out being the only game in town had an advantage. Others were interested. And so we started promoting these principles, not only with governments, other international organizations like the European Union, the OECD, but with companies, um, and uh, we're going to hear uh, soon from Marcella, Unilever was the first company to actually issue a freestanding human rights report, which had the additional virtue of being honest about the challenges that Unilever was facing and what you were planning to do about them. Other, other entities as well, labor unions, NGOs, and my favorite, FIFA. In the midst of the corruption scandal at FIFA, I got a call. Would I like to come to Zurich and have a chat with Mr. Sepp Blatter, who was then president of FIFA, about human rights? And I said, come again? <laughs> <laughs> and said, yeah, we, we have some issues. Yeah, damn right, you have some issues. <laughs> but I don't do corruption. You know, I don't give, I don't take, I don't do corruption. But if you're serious about human rights, you've come to the right person, and let's start talking about Qatar. Right? 2022. 
And they said, okay. Long story short, we shook hands. I was going to do an independent sort of audit, a social audit of FIFA's human rights risks and make a bunch of recommendations. And Sepp Blatter said, that's great, thank you. Two weeks later, he was dismissed from FIFA on the grounds of corruption. But the human rights stuck. And it is now, the, the human rights principles are now part of bidding requirements for the World Cup. Never in a million years would I have thought that possible. There were two bidders for the, for the next World Cup that hasn't been allocated yet. One was Morocco. And the king of Morocco had to publish a bunch of edicts in order for his bid to be considered. It wasn't quite good enough. And so Morocco did not make it. And you know who made it, right? The countries formerly known as NAFTA. It's a joint initiative of Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Hard law developments have evolved. Governments began to realize, well, you know, if business is actually buying into this stuff, then it, 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 it can't be that hard to follow up with public policy. You know, usually behind the curve, but in, in this case, not as far as, 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 as one might fear. And so you've got anti-slavery legislation uh, in several countries. The French have adopted a due vigilance law because, well, they're French. Um, the EU, conflict minerals and other such things. Canada is establishing an ombudsperson for the overseas operations of their uh, companies. And there is an ongoing treaty negotiation in Geneva, um, which is not likely to go anywhere, but it does express the desire of many countries to actually have a global um, instrument. Now, for me, the next challenge is right here, to mainstream human rights in investment decisions. Very simple reason, money talks. And there's a lot of money in play. So why? Because I believe that respect for human rights is equivalent to or will create the social sustainability of business. There's environmental sustainability, there's social sustainability, and treating people with dignity is the essence of social uh, sustainability. And how, well, um, we mentioned ESG, we're pushing human rights criteria into ESG investing. Now, ESG investing is skyrocketing. Um, if you graph it, it looks like a hockey stick. It was pretty flat, flat or rising slowly until a financial crisis. And then it turned and you begin to see the hockey stick. And then a certain person got elected president of the United States. And the hockey stick shot up to the ceiling. It's called the Trump bump. And it's christened by Barron's magazine a good business source, um, all, a, a quarter of all assets under management globally now include ESG criteria. Uh, and there is the Trump bump from Barron's. Now, what's this next step um, that I'm personally committed to? Working with, this sounds crazy, but, you know, uh, who cares, right? They can't fire me. I have a chair at Harvard, and <laughs> I've, I, I've, I've done all sorts of things, so I can do a crazy thing now and then. Um, Arabesque is an asset management company. It ha doesn't have a single analyst. It's all tech. They have PhDs crawling all over the place in physics, in mathematics, um, in computer science. I'm working with Arabesque to, quote, 
translate the UN guiding principles into computer algorithms so that artificial intelligence can be combined with big data to actually generate assessments of somewhere between 7,000 and 10,000 companies globally. This, you, you don't have to fill out any more questionnaires, Marcella. You don't, it, it, we can see what you're doing without you, yes, filling out questionnaires. Um, I'm working um, with SHIFT, um, the nonprofit um, that members of my UN team uh, started, um, to, uh, to make this happen. So that's my own personal uh, commitment to get into the world of not only publicly listed companies, but also um, private equity. And so, ESG, um, I think, um, is key to the sustainability of business and human rights are the core uh, of the S. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. It's fine. Yep. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you. Professor Ruggie gave us a lot to think about in, in terms of developments right now in, in uh, bringing the, uh, the UN guiding principles to business. Now, I'm going to invite another distinguished speaker to build on that, but she's going to give us a very different perspective. So our next speaker is Marcella Manubens, and she is Global Vice President for Integrated Social Sustainability at Unilever. So a, a company that's universally considered a front runner in sustainability and human rights. And Marcel is a leader in the field, but from a different angle than John Ruggie. So John Ruggie was coming at it more from the international perspective, while Marcella has been kind of pushing the boundaries from inside business and pushing business forward as well as in some of the collaborations with, with other, uh, with multi-stakeholder initiatives like the Fair Labor Association and the Global Social Compliance Program. So she's an early pioneer, and she established one of the first human rights programs in a company, in PBH, back in the early 1990s, when most companies were trying to figure out if human rights even had something to say outside of the political sphere. So now I'd like to invite Marcella to share her thinkings on development in human rights from the inside perspective of business. Marcella? Thank you. Well, first of all, whoever knows me knows that I'm always cold. So I'm sorry if you see me shivering each at the temperature in the room. It's a pleasure for me to be with you today. And Margaret, you're absolutely right. I'm coming after the one and only, you know, John Raggi. I'm standing in your shoulders of giants. I mean, I cannot but, uh, you know, thank you for the incredible work and leadership, John. Um, I learned and we couldn't have done it uh, without your incredible um, creation, the godfather of the UN Guiding Principles. So the question that people ask me more often than none is, how does it work at Unilever? I mean, how do you put it together? And when they ask me this question, it reminds me, it brings me back to 2013, uh, as I was joining Unilever, I wanted to celebrate human rights, and we decided to, to do something very simple and ask our leadership, the CEO, the human rights, uh, the human rights, that was me, the <laughs> human resources officer, the, the, the marketing and communication officer, the legal officer. We wanted to ask them a simple question, including myself. What does human rights mean to you? Now, no script. No, no uh, UN guiding principles or no, no universal declaration. What means to you personally? So our ambition at that point was very simple, to have a homemade video. I didn't know if I was going to use it, but just to understand where we were standing as individuals and as leaders. The result was the most impactful, transforming, you know, a striking message that we were able to put together. Whether it was the person who grew up in South Africa in anti-apartheid rule, 
or apartheid rule the, in Latin America under military dictatorship, but the person who was very privileged growing up in India, and only in her first job, she was able to go to a community that was so impoverished that she really understood how the rest of the world were living and what deprivation was uh, all about. And what we realized at that time is that we got conviction. And it's that conviction, collective conviction, that really carry on the work that we do at Unilever. It's not one person, it's the sum of the parts that make us move it forward. So we believe that human rights, really believe that human rights is the foundation of our business. We understand that our supply and distribution chains involve millions of people. And through our products and advertising, we, we really touch the lives, the lives of billions. So we also understand that human rights abuses exist in the markets and geographies and business that we operate. In our own operations, we are not perfect. So we know the responsibility to identify those abuses, stop them, and prevent them. Just what you ask us to do, John, with the UNGPs. So human rights for us at Unilever is not a compliance program. We do need the due diligence process, but it's not about that. In human rights, if human rights is the foundation of our, of our business, then, sorry, I'm gonna put this, thank you. <laughs> if, if it's truly the foundation of our business, then we need to think about human rights at the decision-making process, at the beginning of times, not later on, when we are creating, when we are innovating. I mean, I think that Bas gave us tremendous uh, examples of what that looks like. We need to embed it in the business formula. That is why in 2014 then, we expanded our Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, which is our uh, compass, our roadmap for sustainable and responsible business. We expanded to include three pillars. One of them is fairness in the workplace. It's all about human rights. It's about embedding human rights and the UNGPs in everything that we do every day, every corner of the organization. Opportunity for women is the second pillar, and it's all about women's empowerment and inclusion. It's about the tripod of the rights, the skills to succeed, and the opportunities. And inclusive business models, our third pillar within the social ambition, uh, drives the social and economic inclusion that is really at the bottom of the pyramid and is very much linked to our business. Uh, Smallholder farmers, small scale retailers, young entrepreneurs. And the, each of these pillars, we have a specific targets by 2020. And I, I talk about this approach because it's critical about how we drive this agenda. It cascades throughout our company when we look into the business, we look with all those different lenses. It's not perfect, but we look into all those different lenses. And as a matter of fact, our performance is measured against those ambitions. Examples, so by now you may be thinking, well, well Marcella, tell me how does it work? Well, examples of, of these kind of activity that we have, safety, our safety for women and girls and boys program. It was born in 2013. Uh, after identifying really tremendous, you know, difficult conditions that we have in our own tea plantations in Kenya. So we start working, not only we correct it what we need it, but we say, let us flip it. Let us just drive safety for women and girls and boys. So we work with local NGOs, we build capacity, you know, police, schools, hospitals, teenagers, children, village elders, management, business partners. And rather than telling women what they will make them safe, we asked them, what will it make you safe? They knew exactly the corner where there was no light and there were issues happening. You know, what happened to the girls if they worked back to, from earlier from school and they were not in the houses? So this approach, this sea of action, really transformed that community. And we are very privileged to partner with you and women to expand this model to India. The idea is to create a blueprint that is cost effective and is also scalable so we can interact with supply chain and the different you know, uh, stakeholders to really make it happen in other communities. And IDH, the, the Dutch Development Agency, is also expanding and investing 
in, in the tea industry in uh, Kenya. We signed a joint commitment with IUF and Industrial, the two largest unions in our operations, on preventing sexual harassment. So we work with them together to advance this. We launched an, the UnStereotype initiative to remove outdated and unhelpful stereotypes from advertising and change the mindset to promote equal opportunities, including equal pay. But it's not just equal jobs, same job, same pay, but really expanding the opportunities to those higher job opportunities that we need to have for women and for diversity at large. We created and implemented a framework for fair wage, our version of living wage, across our global operations. You know, it's embedded now as part of our human resources policy is non-negotiable. Uh, financial inclusion and literacy as part of our smallholder farmers, you know, program, land rights and land use, tea wages in Malawi, an, in an initiative led by Oxfam, eradication of forced labor, you know, working with the industry, with CGF, and driving the three principles that are so critical and so simple. No worker should pay for a job. No worker should pay for a job. Every worker should have the freedom of movement, and every worker should not be in debt or coerced to work. So we work with the B20 for inclusion of an effective and action-orientated plan, because there cannot be a sustainable and responsible growth if you have, while you have forced labor or human trafficking. Addressing the increasing borderless workforce, often subject to abuse and the most vulnerable conditions, resulted in our temporary labor policy with the 10 golden rules, which includes freedom of association, effective grievance mechanism, and, a, and putting a women's lens. Because in general, guess what? Women are the most vulnerable in this process. We have a sustainable employment you know, task force together with the union, and we are looking into issues like automation, the employment of the future. We strengthen the safety standards uh, and use technology innovation, you know, drones for, to improve construction safety or, or smartphones to, to drive, you know, messages, alerts to workers in the farm when there is inclement weather. Our responsible sourcing policy is at the heart of the social accountability program for our extended supply chain. To give you a sense of, of um, quantity, I mean, tier one suppliers, we have approximately 55,000 suppliers. So multiply that, let us assume, just is ridiculous, but 10 suppliers of those, you know, 55,000 suppliers to put you in half a million or a million. Uh, and on transparency, you know, we were the first company, as John said, to issue the standalone human rights report using the UN reporting framework and methodology that John and Shift, you know, uh, developed for us. The, the quality of that engagement and consultation that John and, and, uh, has brought to that process, the clarity of the UNGP framework, state protect, business respect, and when issues arise, we, we engage in remedy, has allowed us to advance, truly advance the respect of human rights in the most difficult environment and to have that conversation. But make no mistakes, we are not perfect. We have significant challenges like all of us, and, and we had tons of work to get done. And like society at large, you know, our business must adapt to what we call the increasing VUCA world volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, you know, between, you know, this week, I mean, every single week, it presents a different scenario in some location globally, and we need to adapt. We have a presence in over 190 countries, not quite as much as Coca-Cola, as we said before, but um, we are quite present in many countries. So at, pre at present, we are revisiting our salient human rights issues. We are engaging with the stakeholders internally, externally. We want to hear what people think are the most important components. We do it at the global and at the local level. We call it global. Equity and inclusion continue to be the top concerns. And the ways that we are working also continue to be the strongest concern. Workers and communities have the right to participate and benefit 
of all this economic activity. So this brings me to the issues, the four issues that are top of our minds right now. To put responsible in front of automation, AI and, digit and digitalization, Leslie's gonna talk more about that, you know, and to take into account the human. Plan for an effective transition, a win-win outcome. Embed human rights at the creation and transformation point for all those new business. Every project must have a social impact component that we understand when we go from point A to point B what that looks like and that we take an active, effective action to really address any potential negative impact. BSR is leading this discussion. You heard Jacob uh, yesterday and Tara Norton. I don't know where Tara is, but she conducted a fantastic insight for discussion for us in Europe. And the variance of the estimates of new jobs and few, you know, lost jobs should give us a reason for pause and thought. The truth is we don't really know. And this is intimately linked to the employment of the future. People are talking about inner core, outer core. The employment relations and industrial relations are being transformed and redefined. And the question is, are we fit for purpose? The whole wiring that we have, including international conventions, to really tackle the challenges that come to us. What is top of my mind right now, is what is the true cost of transformation? What is the true cost of transformation when we put all the elements that we will be managing right now? This radical transformation. Transparency and new business models uh, that deliver true economic and social uh, inclusion are paramount and must go hand in hand with the environmental agenda. John, you said it and Vaz said it. I mean, it just, we cannot compete. I mean, they are incredible interdependencies. And if you don't believe, I mean, we experience every day dealing with deforestation, but then where are the conditions of those workers in palm oils, right? In fact, I argue, and forgive me for this, but I argue that the notion of net positive as well intended as it is, it can cover all kinds of sins. The collective information, the collaboration and partnerships are the future as well. Someone reminded me yesterday, is, it has to be a West Coast colleague of the word competition or competition. That word that, you know, it, it, it can drive, you know, I don't know how many lawyers are in the room, but this idea that we cooperate and compete, you know, in the industry. I'm sure, Aaron, you were a lawyer. Uh, we'll, we'll send shivers <laughs> to the lawyers in the room. But you know what? You all get over and you will help us to do it right. And, uh, right? Um, and sharing the resources that continue being more finite is going to be a foregone conclusion in the future. There is no question about it. Finally, the speed of change and impact to the individual, to the family, to the community, to business. If we don't address this preemptively, if we don't get it right, we are gonna have the next big human crisis in our hands. We heard a lot of positives, so I'm a, a cautious optimist, but we need to get that job done. So in the flip side of this, I think that we have tons of opportunities, and we heard many during the course since yesterday. I am leaning in in those positive opportunities. I know that Unilever is. We heard even in the financial transformation, social bonds, green bonds, what John, the, 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 the incredible arabesque you know, project that you are undertaking. We are wired. We had the UNGP, the SDGs, we had the Paris Agreement. They are all fantastic opportunities to deliver. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Marcella, for giving us that, that good inside perspective of, of what it takes for a, a company to really implement some of these human rights issues. 
Now, we're going to be joined by our, our last leader, and she's going to take yet a, a different perspective. So moving from inside the company, now we're going to move to some of the challenges around human rights and business, both now and in the future. So challenges that we're experiencing, such as uh, with the pervasiveness of technology and things like artificial intelligence. So Leslie Harris is an advocate for international freedom and civil liberties. She's a human rights lawyer and a public policy expert. For a decade, she was the president and CEO of Center for Democracy and Technology, and she played a pioneering role in the internet policy debates of the early 2000s, including establishing the GNI. She's the founder and president of a mission-driven tech policy firm in Washington, and she remains deeply committed to closing the digital divide and to strengthening the voice of civil society in this debate. Please join me in welcoming Leslie. So I've been asked to talk briefly about the new human rights challenges that are presented by technological change. If you had asked me this question 10 years ago, I would have talked almost exclusively about internet companies and the challenges that they were facing as they were globalizing uh, and facing uh, demands from governments for censorship or access to user information. Um, today, companies across sectors face human rights challenges that are related to the adoption of new technologies. Um, but those challenges arise from the adoption within their own operations, as well as from governments. Uh, the most significant that I'm going to focus on is the, the rise of AI-enabled technologies. Um, data has become the oil in our economy. Uh, there are over 2.5 quadrillion, I have no idea what that means, bytes of data that are created each day, and they are mostly held by companies. Uh, and a great deal of that data is personal information. It is the raw material, almost a fungible commodity, uh, for advertising, for new products and services, for medical breakthroughs, smart cities, driverless cars, Alexa, uh, and many other personalized services. But there is a risk that we have lost personal agency uh, and that our fundamental rights are increasingly becoming a negative externality in our businesses. Uh, increasingly, as we have this high stakes battle going on, uh, right now heavily between China and the United States uh, to develop more and more innovative uses of artificial intelligence. And as, those, as that artificial intelligence becomes more powerful, um, that the kinds of technologies that we can develop using AI are going to be making more and more highly consequential decisions about people, and very often in an individual capacity. Human rights and the rule of law may actually be at risk. Um, what rights? The UN Special Rapporteur for Free Expression, David Kay, recently released an important report, which I commend to you, uh, on artificial intelligence uh, and human rights with a focus on business. And he offered what I think is a pretty sobering list. Uh, free expression, the right to self-determination, access to information, privacy, non-discrimination, and most importantly, the right to a remedy, which is also the central, I still call them the ruggy principles, and I always will. Um, what's so different here? Well, basically, we are talking about technologies that are able to extract from extremely large data sets patterns. And those patterns lead to the creation of rules. And, new, and they learn from new data, and the new data changes those rules. And then those rules get applied. And if they're applied, to, so, so basically, 
It's the human brain on steroids, and the decisions are very unlikely to be understood by any of us in this room. So if they begin to make predictions and consequential decisions about people, we are unlikely to know why. Um, right now, AI supports online advertising networks that shape our buying habits. Um, they are used to shape our political opinions, to curate and moderate content online, to determine the search results we get, what news information we see, and significantly, what we don't see. Um, the misinformation campaigns during the last election were effective because they were assisted by the same content curation tools to target so-called fake news to the people where it would have the greatest impact. I do not think it's an overstatement that these systems, and David Kay believes it, so I'm going to hide behind him on this one, uh, that they play a central role today in our access to knowledge and our free speech. But there's a lot more. When we receive online advertising that are related to jobs or housing, it's likely an AI-powered system has decided you are somebody who should receive that ad. It is also probably, in some circumstances, decided that a woman or a minority or certainly an older person should not receive that ad. Um, importantly for business, Right now, AI-enabled screening software uh, is deciding who should make it to an interview stage. It's being used everywhere. Uh, and it was just last week that Amazon decided to withdraw its homemade uh, screening software system because, and, and I quote, it hated women. <laughs> uh, why? How can a software hate women? Well, because if you build a system and train the system on data that is mostly men and identify the characteristics in those men, the patterns in those men that were successful, and then you build rules based on that, you're going to get a lot less women through the screening process. And, the, and these technologies are deployed everywhere. So if you're in a business that has nothing to do with technology, but you're using that software from somebody else, look at it carefully, is all I can say. Um, courts, law enforcement agencies are increasingly using these predictive software tools uh, made by private firms uh, to decide whether somebody should get bail, how long that they're sentenced, or to predict whether or not they're likely to commit a crime. And I think important, and it's been in the news, facial recognition technologies developed with AI-assisted algorithms continue to misidentify black and brown people, and they are now about to be deployed by law enforcement, ICE, and the military for applications that are fundamentally will impact rights. And I think you saw some protests in some of the big companies about this. On the one hand, I was heartened by that. On the other hand, it suggested that it is very late in the process to decide whether a particular use of a technology uh, is, uh, is appropriate. Um, finance, insurance, uh, the list goes on, and the future, I think, is clear. We don't have to wait to the, sing what is the singularity. Um, it's happening now, it'll continue to happen, and all of your companies are gonna benefit and society is gonna benefit. But should we be concerned? Yes, why? Well, because we can't afford to move fast and break things anymore, because when we do, we will not even know that it's broken. Because AI systems often embed uh, all kinds of biases, as I described about the um, screening software, societal biases, individual biases, could be in the data sets, um, uh, they could be unrepresentative. Um, and they may be unrecognized biases. And it's very difficult to observe the bias even as you watch the algorithm displayed, uh, deployed. For example, Low-income people who live farther away from the job 
were eliminated by one employment screening technology because a pattern determined in, in deploying the technology found that living close to the job was a, uh, a criteria for success. People applied, they hired people, none of them were low income. If they were seeking diversity, they didn't get it. Women are routinely screened out of job opportunities because similar algorithms are trained on data uh, that is almost entirely male. The biggest challenge that you face in these kinds of decisions about people is that unlike a decision made and documented by a person, the complexity of these systems makes it extremely difficult to interrogate, challenge, or even explain. Um, the logic be behind an AI tool may not be evident, even to a train, somebody who's trained in the system. By the time somebody seeks an explanation, the algorithm, which is always learning, has, has a different set of rules. So how should these AI systems be governed? Um, can they be made more transparent and accountable, and who should take the lead? Surely government has the principal role in protecting human rights, and the EU has taken a modest, modest step forward by requiring a right to explainability uh, in the data protection regulation. It's a start, but honestly, I don't know if it's going to prove effective given the opacity of these systems. But companies really can't wait for lawmakers to respond. Uh, public policy, particularly on technology, lags, I think, 20 years uh, in my experience. And as human rights actors, if your company is deploying or using uh, tools that make consequential decisions about people, or even support those decisions, this is one of the most important and difficult human rights challenges that new technologies are likely to pose. Um, recently, David Kay um, offered a set of sort of first steps for companies uh, which place human rights at the center from the outset to conduct human rights-based assessments of new decision tools, to provide transparency to customers, uh, prioritize the elimination of bias in the development and employment of these tools, provide remedies, and make systems audible. Um, it is a change, this is a challenge that needs to be incorporated into your social responsibility agenda. And this is not a task solely for lawyers or for technologists. Um, this is, uh, if you want to understand and operationalize these human rights obligations into this complicated world that we're moving into, if we want an AI-driven future that we get the benefits, but we're also able to place people and their rights at the center of innovation, the time to begin is now. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Leslie. We, we've had um, a, a lot of information to cover in a very short amount of time, starting 70 years ago with the foundation of the international human rights regime to, to some of the uh, different initiatives in the international space from the, the UN Global Compact, the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. We've explored how that was implemented in the space of, of individual companies and the complexities there, as well as we've taken that to some of the complexities outside that we're facing now and in the future with things like technology. Now, I know there's, there's probably a lot of, of thoughts and ideas that have been generated, and our speakers will be available after the session, and so you can approach them with ideas. But also, we want to let you go to some of the next sessions, because, of course, there'll be human rights that, that will be considered and debated in a lot of the subsequent sessions today and tomorrow. So please, as a, as a last step, join me in thanking our three distinguished leaders and speakers for their time.